Hello and thank you for joining our webinar, Content, the Fuel That Drives Learning. Today you'll be hearing from Summer Solomonson. Hi, Summer. She's the head of Content Cornerstone Studios here at Cornerstone. Summer will share her deep expertise in the critical role content plays in your learning strategy. You'll walk away with a thorough understanding of how, con how the right content can help boost engagement and productivity while also addressing key business challenges. And just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. I'm Yvette Bassan, I'll be the moderator for today. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and we will send out the recording to all registrants after the event concludes. We really encourage you to be an active participant in today's presentation. Please add your questions in the Q&A widget anytime throughout the presentation. And we plan to save 10 minutes at the end for live Q&A. Additional resources such as the slides and assets are available to download in the resources widget. Also, continuing education credit is available for this presentation. You must stay on for the entire webinar and complete the post-event survey to receive the codes. Lastly, if you're having any technical difficulties hearing us or seeing the visuals, please send us a message by using the Q&A widget or the chat widget. Without further ado, I'd now like to introduce you to Summer. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Summer. Summer brings over 20 years of experience in helping companies of all sizes craft high-impact modern learning experiences. She was most recently the Chief Learning Officer at Grovo and the recipient of Brandon Hall's 2017 Emerging Star Award. Summer, I'm so excited for you to present today to our audience. Take it away. Thank you so much, Yvette, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. I, I love these kinds of slides, the, the resume slide where, you know, you're supposed to be dazzled with what I've done. The value I hope to bring to you today is a new way to think about content in your workplace. Over the last several years, we've had a lot of growth in this area. I definitely have some decided opinions on it, but we'll talk through a little of that shift and we'll, uh, we'll get through it. For me, what I'm most passionate about is working with the people that are doing the work. Um, I started my career in L&D as a practitioner, as a uh, mid-level learning manager in a healthcare organization, about 1,200 employees in New Mexico, and those were my training ground years. Those were the years that I learned how to do virtual presentation and onboarding and uh, starting to create that virtual content that is so valuable for our employees. Um, though I did start my career as a high school English teacher, English major, very proud English major here, um, and I believe that we are slowly but surely taking over the world, because what's more important than learning how to read and write and tell people about it? So let's jump right in. Today we're going to move through a few pieces, get to the end. I want to take your questions. Some of you have already been sending those in in advance. Uh, we do have the Q&A module lit up for you, so feel free to send those in and, and we'll take some time for Q&A at the end. I want to start with this concept of kind of learning for the modern work, workforce. We hear this term modern a lot. And sadly, I think it's kind of becoming one of those phrases that we tend to slap on in the front of anything we're doing to give that sense of new, powerful, impactful, I really want to get to the root of what we're trying to say here when we use this concept of modern, and then let's start thinking about content as a way to drive impact. Big, big concepts. Um, and then we'll look at what Cornerstone is doing here. So as Yvette mentioned, I'm the head of Cornerstone Studios. And I'll tell you, most of my peers in this space are like, your title is what now? <laughs> You're a head of studios. This is where content is going. I believe that we are at this phenomenal shift in the industry of saying that content for employees should be just as powerful, impactful, and relevant as the content we consume in the rest of our lives. So we'll talk a little bit about that and see how that might support you and your initiatives. So let's jump right in. Shifting demands. All right, those of you that have been in this space for a long time, this is not a new concept slide to you, but this is really gonna set the stage for where we are today. Training, how many of you started your career and your title was like training administrator, training and development? That was true for me. However many years ago, the industry was really predicated on this command and control model. 
we centralize training in an organization, we identify what our people need to know, and then we tell them it. <laughs> and usually this is done with people in seats during onboarding or in a classroom model. We check the box for the year or we say, this is what we want our managers to know, done. Training is top down. And then somewhere over the last decade, maybe seven to eight years, the industry started to shift towards this learning focused model, this learning space of bottom up, learner first, another buzzword that we love to use in this industry, but really thinking about how do learners think about the workplace? What types of things are motivating to them? How do they wanna consume content? What should programs look like in an organization that empower, catalyze, activate? All of those really awesome verbs that we didn't really get to use a lot of before. So when we think about learning, this is a fundamental shift to democratization of workplace learning, maybe, and content in my mind is the fuel for that. When we look at the broad world of kind of learning platforms, HR platforms, their value from a learner's perspective is in their anonymity, in the fact that I shouldn't have to think about it. When I go into an LMS, I should not be consumed with where do I click next? It should be intuitive. It should be background. What is forefront is content because content is connection and content is emotion and content is story. So let's dive in here. If we've set the stage to we're moving to this place of kind of learning now and training then, there is this fundamental shift all right, and these are things we know as professionals, but I wanna set this groundwork. Some of you, I can almost see it through the, through the webcam into your space. There's a lot of nodding going on. These are things that we recognize as professionals, but we may not always verbalize. And this is also a moment to say, you are empowered to drive this change in your organization. Whether or not you see that, you are positioned to catalyze meaningful change as HR practitioners, as learning practitioners. I believe there is a shift in how the workplace sees our role instead of just the make it so we need management training. There is now this movement to, holy moly, we have to keep our people engaged. How do we do that? Maybe training isn't just a solution. Maybe learning is a tool. So we look at this kind of formal push top down, maneuvering into this push and pull conversation. And those are things we love to talk about in this industry, push versus pull, getting people involved. The underlying current to me in that push versus pull conversation is, yes, there are things that your people just have to do in the workplace. There is content that they must consume and it is push based. Our job in creating content should always be to remove the barriers to entry because there is no use case in which a learner in the workplace is gonna be fundamentally, give me more learning all day long, that's all I wanna do. So the content itself needs to be built with the design in mind that the content is built that we consume in our regular life. For some reason, we have lived too long in this HR space that content in the workplace doesn't have to be compelling. It doesn't have to earn trust. It doesn't have to connect. We just tell them to do it and so they do it. And I think that conceptual change of seeing content as fuel in an organization moves us past just the basic push-pull conversation and takes us to a new place of if learners recognize that they need content, they need learning to excel, then it's just our job to earn their attention and keep it. So let's keep going. A lot of this is kind of base level stuff. Learning happens everywhere. What I love about talking about this with our customers, with my team, is learning in the workplace oftentimes falls under this kind of false paradigm that you do your job and then you learn and then you go back and do your job. As a learning practitioner myself, I am a passionate believer 
in learning as a driver of organizational change. That's where I've done most of my study and my research and looking across industries to say, where does that change happen? I'm gonna give you guys, throw you out a little statistic here that's meant to empower you in your role. Um, I don't often do this because don't you love it when people like list out data points as if, you know, that's credibility, but stay with me. 2013, Stanford professor ben, Dr. Benham Tabrizi does a global study on change initiatives in organizations across industry. He was looking for that golden pearl, that driver, what was consistent across these, whether it be automotive or pharmaceutical, big companies, small companies. And he found that large in part, and we know this through a lot of, a lot of change studies, roughly 70% always fail. Change initiatives usually fail. What he found as the most consistent indicator of success in these studies was that companies who activated their middle managers were far more likely to succeed in change initiatives. Middle managers are the catalyst for change, and middle managers are the ones that are engaging with employees as learners. They are most connected with the day-to-day -day work. They are most connected with on the ground, temperature of the function, what people are doing. So when we think about learning, let me challenge you to start thinking about learning in all its aspects, not just what they consume because of what you told them to consume, but what they are consuming outside of that regulation, the people they are using in their organization to gain insight, the person on the floor that always seems to have her own workaround or a job aid that she's created to get through something quicker, the way they're using teams to get ahead. <laughs> I laugh at this because I, I think about kind of business travel and how much of my life is on the road or in airplanes. When I was working on my doctorate out of USC, fight on for all you Trojans here, I wrote my dissertation on a plane, in a plane seat, sitting like this, you know, with your elbows tucked to your sides, just trying to type, thinking only four more hours to New York trying to get that done, that was learning. Learning happens everywhere. So let's keep walking down this path of shifting our mindset and shifting the way we think about content in the organization. Okay, buzzword alert, millennials. Uh, some of you may be beyond fatigued at this conversation. I find that when I use the word millennials, <laughs> people usually do one of two things. They either go big eye roll or kind of the arm cross, like, please don't tell me one more thing about this generation in the workplace. Here's the thing. What we have seen with each generation that's come into the workplace is a shift in how the workplace operates. So I look back to my dad who grew up kind of in uh, kind of traditionalist, very, very early on baby boomer, was a mathematician, went into kind of aerospace. He could expect to have a very long career, pretty consistent, where he retired and got his gold watch and his pension. We fundamentally know that that expectation has shifted in the workplace. So when we talk about millennials, you know, valuing training or valuing content, I see it as a very smart group who has said, I know that I can't expect to be in one job, nor that I want to be in one place for my career. So I have to keep learning. That is how change happens. And I'm a behavioralist for those of you that are really into learning theory, meaning I don't believe learning happens until you see change. Change is the evidence of learning. So when we look at this kind of thirst for learning, this content-based learning model, think of it this way. Roughly 50% of your organization is probably millennials. Gen Z, who comes after, which we call the true first digital natives. This is a group that has only existed in a world with the internet. They're going to be 20% by the end of 2020. 20%, one out of five, and that's based on your U.S. Census Bureau. So that's roughly 70 to 75% of your org that is predicating value in content, in learning, in access to meaningful collateral. And just as a side note for you Gen Xers on the line, I know no one cares about us. Nobody talks about Gen X. But anyway, for this conversation, this is how I see it. Younger generations that are coming in the org realize that learning, and for our purposes today, content consumption, is really the surest way for career mobility. 
and this is borne out in all sorts of studies. Those of you that read the white papers, look at all that information. Here's my two cents on uh, white papers and HR research reports. I believe this industry sees significant change every five to eight years, maybe decade. And then in the intervening years, we see white papers churned out constantly that have slight nuanced influences to those things. So over the last 10 years, we've been hearing the organizational structure is changing. We're moving to teams instead of hierarchical command and control. And we're also seeing that employees across the board are saying organizations that take an interest in my growth and development are organizations that I wanna stay with longer. So that's what this slide should tell you. All right, so let's move into content a little bit. The fuel to drive learning, isn't that just a great phrase? I love that phrase. All right, some more data points for you. And those of you that are thinking about socializing this internally, what data points should I use? How should I talk about this in my organization? This is a slide that I use quite often that I have pulled out data points from various white papers to create the landscape of content, where I see it in our industry and where I see it going. So when we talk about content, you cannot talk about it without curation. All content we consume as employees, as humans, as people who exist in this world is curated or should be, okay? The Spotify subscription that we have or Pandora or whatever Amazon is giving us, that stuff is curated. Even when we go online and do searches, it knows what types of things you usually look at. And most of this curation we just live with, we accept. And yet somehow we come in the workplace and we don't apply that lens to the content we give our people. We don't think about giving them content that is targeted to their role or their career path or their search titles or what they're interested in or the teams they're working on or the projects that we've given them. So the way we see it at Cornerstone and the way I see it in my team uh, across studios by Coastal Studio Operation is that we know across the board executives are prioritizing the upskilling of their employees. If they're going to retain them, then they have to keep them and they have to give them content that's valuable and meaningful, right? So we know this as a trend. And yet look down at the bottom, the 6% one, this one came out of a Deloitte report, I believe in 2018. And this is one of those like global surveys where they send it out to HR leaders, L&D leaders and say, are you successfully anticipating your employee needs? And what's interesting about these is when people self-identify and fill out surveys, generally speaking, we tend to have a rosier view of what we do. All right, we're more comfortable saying, yeah, we do this better than we think, or yes, we always apply data when we're making decisions, those types of things. And yet just 6% said, yeah, we're really good at anticipating needs and supplying them with meaningful content. That's an alarming number. Then we move over to the side and we know the vast majority says the days of just massive libraries is done. More does not equal better. We cannot predicate the value of a content library on its quantity. It must be predicated on its quality, the right content. What I've learned over the years, especially in working with global companies, helping them architect learning and thinking about content is when you give employees and learners specifically more choices in a virtual setting, they choose nothing. They don't choose more, they choose nothing. They want something that's relevant. And what we've learned in the way my team creates content specifically is if we take a, a, a page out of the kind of the web playbook and we think about how long we give a web page or something online to earn our attention, that's roughly six to eight seconds. That's how long we have to gain trust. That's how long we have to earn attention with content. So if content is starting with a long lead-in or a list of objectives or someone talking at them and telling them what they need to know, that is probably not something they're gonna see through to the end. And then over at the bottom right, can't do a slide on content without talking about microlearning. Um, as you saw in my bio, I was the chief learning officer at Grovo, uh, came over to Cornerstone just a year ago, actually a year last week, 
when Cornerstone acquired Grovo and I was able to bring my content creation team now here to build content on a global scale, but micro learning was our passion. And I know we had a few questions about that in the, in the pre Q and A, and you may have some more, I'm happy to answer those as those come in. So this is really the kind of the table stakes of what we're seeing out there. We're, we're, we're prioritizing the upskilling of our employees, but we're not good at anticipating employee needs. We're overwhelmed with the content options we have, and yet we know that we need unique methods and modalities to keep their interest. All right, it's not a bleak thing, I promise. So let's move into something kind of around business impact, how you can see content as driving change in your organization. I'm gonna start with one of my most beloved quotes. On my laptop, I keep a blue sticky, virtual sticky note of quotes that, that impact me as a learning professional. And this one is pulled from the first or second paragraph of an article that Peter Senge wrote in 1980 for the Sloan Review out of MIT. And this was one of the first times that the industry was talking about building learning cultures. I, I believe the title is Building a Learning Organization. We think these are new concepts. They've been around for a long time and, and we, we kind of cycle through them. But this is, his, this is his call to action, that over the long run, superior performance depends upon superior learning. This has got to be a driving motivator for us and a North Star for how we think about our strategy and how we think about our people. Ironically, if you Google that article, you can find it in Peter Senge, MIT learning organizations. The first paragraph starts with some anecdote about how the speed of business is quickening. It's 1980, okay? <laughs> we laugh at that. And I think about what fast paced work looked like then. I think about my dad coming home from work and saying, wow, I just got my own phone line at work. And that was like a huge coup because it wasn't at the certain level of director level to require his own phone line. When my dad came home from work in the 80s, he was home from work. There was nothing else going on. There was no constant slacks or IMs or things coming in. And yet even at that time, the industry recognized things are quickening. Things are happening faster and we need to respond to this. So how do we do this in light of content as fuel? Let's think about business impact of learning. More fuel for you uh, to float this internally, to seed kind of this discussion around content. This is a great snip to take for those of you that like to do that in these presentations. But we think about innovation, productivity, engagement, and retention. These aren't drivers for change. I don't know what are. And this is really that kind of big umbrella around learning cultures. Now, the one thing I'll caution when I talk with companies around building learning cultures and this kind of concept of, yes, we want a learning culture, we want our people engaged, what's fascinating to me is most don't think about the way learning cultures actually behave. In learning cultures, employees are empowered to ask, why? <laughs> why did you give this to me? Why did you assign this to me? This might be better. We think about creative tension in meetings. We think about the ability to say no to things, to propose new ideas, to dissent with respect. Those are hallmarks of learning cultures. And so I, I would encourage you to really think about this ability to build a learning culture in your organization is driven through the content that we give our people, how we equip them to give and receive more meaningful feedback how we equip them to dialogue more productively, how we equip them to manage projects without having direct supervisory responsibility over people, which is something you might be seeing more and more of. So let's move into this uh, business impact element. What I've done is highlight some of the, some of the use cases that I've see, seen respond best to the influx of meaningful content. So a lot of organizations that I work with, especially in kind of the small, medium business and mid-market space, 
really good about having centralized learning management systems. Maybe they have an LXP overlay. Maybe they use some type of kind of Teams or workplace dialogue or sharing through Slack. But when they think about content, that's where it gets tricky. Most likely, you are not a team of 10 who's building you know, compelling content or have that luxury of either curating it or developing it in-house. So when we think about what you would want with content and the way you'd want to think about it, let's look across these six use cases. Onboarding. Whew. This is when I wish I could see your faces so I can know how many of you are responsible for this, this element in your workplace. Onboarding was something I did for seven years, um, every other week, and I worked at an organization in New Mexico that was very um, decentralized, so lots of remote sites, and yet onboarding was the one time that we brought everyone in to corporate office. This was a healthcare organization, but it also had a lot of uh, human services uh, business lines. They also ran Head Start programs with mobile dental units, all sorts of unique businesses. So onboarding and orientation specifically was the one time that all these disparate roles sat in the same room. And in any given orientation, I might have a doctor, a janitor, a teacher, a bus driver, an administrative assistant, people from wildly different backgrounds, wildly different worldviews, and it made for very compelling dialogue. And yet what I realized, like most companies, the onboarding experience became a sit and get for two solid days because that's the time we have them in the seat. And that's the time they sign this policy or sign this document or complete this required training. And while I recognize the value of that, I'm going to challenge you to think of this through a consumer lens. When we consume content, there is inherent motivation to do so. Okay, when I sit on my couch on a Friday night and I turn on Netflix, I have a lot of reasons to keep trying to find my show or even rebooting it if it, if it breaks or all of those things because I'm driven by that need for kind of entertainment. Very different driver from being driven from a learning perspective, from I need to get better or I've been told I need to do this. So my challenge to you when you think about onboarding in terms of content is have you truly reduced, have you mitigated, have you pushed away all the fluff, all the things that don't necessarily have to be there to create a consumer experience that is memorable. I worked with an organization uh, while I was at Grovo who called this, their onboarding mantra was the stop talking onboarding approach. And their North Star was about saying, let's think about onboarding in terms of what is necessary and requisite in line with, are we giving these first time on campus employees an experience they're gonna connect with through the content that we share with them? My stay focused tip for you in this is around a talk track. We often talk in this industry around marketing our programs internally or marketing them up to leadership. Yeah, I don't think we're really good at this. We think that marketing means having a meeting with stakeholders and telling them these are the changes we've opted for in onboarding and uh, you know th that's what we're doing. That's not marketing. Here's my challenge to you. This is something that I do internally as well when my team is coming up to new programs or we're trying to go in a new innovative way. I think about the critical stakeholders that are going to be affected or impacted by the program I'm building. And this is specifically related to onboarding because you're looking at so many different teams across the organization. Identify for yourself the three bulleted phrases or keywords that you want to remember in order to start seeding that change and marketing the program and gaining allies for you. I do sticky notes that are color coded. I'm ruthlessly organized, but I have a big team that spans both coasts and we have a lot of things in pro process. So I like to think about the talk track in terms of what are the key phrases I'm going to use to influence this person at this time when I have that 30 second random meet in the hallway or the opportunity to ride up in an elevator or walking out the door at the same time at the end of the day. Challenge yourself to think about how you are using that talk track to your benefit. 
Compliance. Ooh, compliance is also one of those things that I think has just gotten short shrift over the last uh, many decades. We think it is something we have to do, which it is. We think it is check the box exercise, which large in part it is. And the resulting content means we haven't given it the same design thinking that we've given everything else. We have not thought about it from the perspective of, am I earning the learner's attention? And we have certainly not thought about it from the perspective of, am I actually believing that this content is going to make meaningful change in their workplace, in our workplace, and in their lives? For, for my team, for Cornerstone Studios, compliance has been something that we have thought about in terms of that modern moniker over the past year. Specifically with our work at Grovo and then coming into Cornerstone, we said there has to be a different way to approach compliance. So historically, we think about it in terms of very concrete, scenario-based, legal-driven concepts, fine, but we have not built learning that is compelling in a sense of how can I actually build better, build better relationships or support my team or heal fractures in my organization? And oftentimes compliance training like harassment training is predicated on if I show people some cringeworthy scenarios of harassment in the workplace that they may never witness in their lifetime, then somehow they're not gonna be harassers themselves or when they witness it, they're, they're gonna realize that it's wrong. Ironically, all this does is teach people, I've never seen this scenario, so my workplace must be okay. The way we've approached this through our modern compliance offering, which is part of our subscription, is thinking about how can we underpin compliance in terms of unconscious bias, in terms of building an active bystander community, helping people identify conversations that might not be appropriate and respond in meaningful ways, helping them build psychological safety, helping them empower their employees to respond to things as they see it. And a lot of our focus was on managers. So the last thing I'll tell you, tell you in this total truth moment, when we were doing this program for the first time and really thinking about building content with those underpinnings of largely DNI me methods and methodologies that we see in the workplace, we decided to do a team level psychological safety survey. And for those of you that haven't done this before, it's a lot about recognizing, are your people confident in their ability to provide a dissenting opinion or disagree in a public way? Or do they feel that their ideas are recognized? And there's a lot of kind of statements like that that people say yes, no, strongly agree, strongly disagree. We sent that out and one of my leads asked me to take a look at the responses. And as I was reading through it, I found myself falling into that classic trap of managers who believe they know their team so well. And some of the responses were not as glowing as I thought, because I thought, sure, my team has psychological safety. We're built on a model of collaboration. We meet together constantly. We're developing things together. Of course, everyone feels that their opinion is valued and heard. And as I started looking at some of the responses, and then they would share some of their feedback over on the right, I found myself going, oh, I, I know who this is. And I know what they're referring to. And that's just not how that went down. And as I went down, there were some very positive things, but I started reflecting on those ones that didn't quite live up to what I believed was the measure of psychological safety on the team. And it challenged me to rethink how I was leading my team. And this all goes back to this compliance mindset. If I am not connecting compliance to the meaningful backbone of my organization, meaning talking about these things in our one-on-one, -on -one, including them in our weekly meetings, giving people an opportunity as an open forum to provide feedback, and doing those temperature checks, that's on me. And what we learn from Dr. Tabrizi is middle managers are the ones that drive this change. So when our employees see that we are referring to the content they consumed and we're thinking about what they took and, and how that impacts our workplace together, it gives it longer life. This is something that's available to us. Management training, um, oftentimes we see this as a very distinct function, 
And we also see management training as a solution. So I, I talk to a lot of customers who their higher up say, managers are leaving after six months, we need management training, as if this is just the solution to the pro problem. My challenge here for you in terms of content is to think of management training as an opportunity to blend into leadership principles. We bifurcate these concepts all the time and management often becomes this kind of, you're managing teams, you're delegating process, you're, you're elevated beam counting in a lot of way and leadership is very visionary and we wanna follow you and you're really imbibing the mission of what we're doing Think of this as a connected process, empowering your managers to set North Stars for their team, to think about content as a way to build these skills, but also to give them those stretch goals. And when we think about this kind of stay focused tip, this is the way I think about it with my org, view it as something that changes with your company. Most management training tends to stay static. And when we build it in organizations, it tends to be something that takes a long time to come to fruition. And by the time it does, your workplace dynamic has changed. You might have new people on your team that weren't there before. And this is a myth. When we think about content, modern content, I'm gonna challenge you to think about content in terms of what works now might not work six months from now, and that's okay. All that is is setting the context for, hey, we're going for MVP here. We're going for minimal, minimal viable product, meaning we don't wanna take six months in a vacuum to present you with this over-architected but beautifully stunning management training. We wanna think about responding to needs now. What are some of the things we're seeing in our manager pool and how can we help them now? And use feedback to improve it in process. What a message of empowerment that you are going through content and your perspective, your response will help us inform the next iteration of this. Not in that black box way, not in that you know guarded lock gates way, but truly that open exchange of this is where we see you guys are, but your process going through this is gonna help make it better. Just keeping an eye on time here. Gonna move through these last few Leadership, we talked about this a little bit. My stay focused tip here is what is the goal for leaders in your organization? I think leadership becomes this very homogenous con concept in companies of they're just leaders. And as someone who's studied this concept a lot, I know leaders come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. It is your job to get down to the root. Maybe you do five whys, maybe you do other type of of approach, but thinking about what does my company value in terms of leadership and how can I capitalize that, capitalize on that in the content we build or the content we serve up to our people? How can I stretch them in the role they are in now and help them get to that uncomfortable place instead of constantly looking at my high performers as hypos and people that have kind of written off at the beginning? Leadership from a studio's perspective from Cornerstone Studios is truly leadership at all levels, baby. That's how the world works. We can always be delightfully surprised by people who show up, who manage a task in a unique way, and content is certainly a fuel mechanism for that. Sales and customer relationships. Um, this is a subscription that Cornerstone has worked on over the past year. Studios partnered with Sandler Training they're a global leader recognized for their um, sales training, and we re-envision their content through our micro-learning lens, okay? Through the way we build micro-learning content. We have a descriptive framework, as we call, so every micro-learning lesson follows this framework, typically five to seven minutes, single concept, okay? And uh, multimodal. So audio, video, all the ways to reinforce that message. This may or may not be something that is valuable to you, but it's certainly something that SMB Insights um, can help you talk through in terms of how can you think about sales training beyond just the sales methodology and more in terms of building that business and professional acumen for your people. One of the core values here 
for sales training and the what we built with Sandler was that sales professionals are made, not born. This is a skill, a professional skill that you can perfect and utilize through content. And ultimately career growth, which is kind of a big concept in itself. And some of you are like career growth, that's everything we do. Yes, content needs to be deployed to impact career growth. So when you think about retaining employees longer, oftentimes that's gonna mean transitioning them laterally, moving them across teams, giving them new challenges, um, giving them an opportunity to learn new things, learn new skills and behaviors. My biggest recommendation for this is similar to what I was talking about with management training, but seeing this as an MVP. Oftentimes career growth initiatives and organizations become highly complex and really over-architected. So I would challenge you, if you're walking down this path of my people want more access to content, they wanna get better at what they're doing, dig deeper. Force yourself to go through the five whys. Force yourself to go through a process of asking, what is at the root of this? And how can I help these people actually get better? All right, so to round out, before we move into some Q&A time, I wanna show you how we view content in the workplace. So Cornerstone Content Anytime, our subscription offering is really based on that model of learner as consumer. And I'll be straight up with you guys, I am not a seller. I am a passionate practitioner. And what I love about my role at Cornerstone is one, I get to have the title head of Cornerstone Studios, which sounds way cooler than I really am. But I get to work with some of the most crackerjack smart people who are thinking about content for the workplace that is just heads and tails above and beyond the rest. So when we think about a subscription, what that actually means, ultimately we need to start holding workplace learning content at par with content that we consume outside of the workplace. And I'm not just talking jazz hands and flash. I mean, the way we develop it needs to be so much more than I have my learning objectives and my pre and post test. It's not compelling in the least. So our subscription model at its core is predicated on Cornerstone Originals, which is all the content Studios produces, curated alongside leading partner content. So one of the biggest values here is saying, Cornerstone has done the work of going out into the marketplace and saying, who are leading in compliance, leadership, professional skills, digital fluency? Who are the people in the world that have already created compelling content? we curate that into the subscription for you. Thinking back to that content curation slide, that shouldn't have to be your job. You wear too many hats as it is. Your job should not have to be going through every piece of content to val validate quality, let alone to validate relevancy or impact. So one of the elements that we've done in our subscriptions is to create playlists. Think of these like playlists in our consumer world, but ways to navigate through the content. Content is most powerful when you connect it with the strategies that are already in place with your org. It's a catalyzing effect. It's a way to say, we believe in this, not in terms of just the all hands meeting where the CEO talks about it, or in your employee handbook, or on the top of every policy, or in our email signature, but this is something that we've actually looked at in terms of giving you access to content that's gonna help you get better. So moving into these, I've talked a little bit about Cornerstone Studios, the work we do very quickly. What I love about the content that we produce is that it's truly diversified in this space. So we still build Grovo content. Those of you that remember Grovo content microlearning, we still build that as part of our output. We're also building truly innovative content. For those of you that, that have a representative or talking to people, ask them to show you DNA. DNA, it's our new offering, unbelievable, okay? This is next level, high fidelity, consumer grade content, all focused around people skills for digital natives. A lot of research to back that up, so I'm gonna bl blow through this fairly quickly, but if you actually Google Cornerstone and DNA, you can check out the reel online. Super proud of that. 
and then co-created content like what we did with Sandler and working with other partners to say, how can we add our expert lens on IP that you have to create compelling content? So topic areas, we talked about these a little bit, leadership, management, professional skills. The other value of having a truly curated offering means that you should be expecting your provider to do the thinking around what are the topics and subjects in this offering? What is it that people should be expected to know? What should my employees be required to engage with in order to demonstrate a level of competency in this type of uh, subject? Final thing, when we build content, and this is one of the things I'm, I'm quite passionate about, I believe that one of the ways this industry has, has kind of gone a little sideways over the last decade is we've undertaken to build content that responds to workplace trends, like needing professional skills and needing change management and management and leadership, all that good stuff. But we haven't said what our point of view is on it. We've assumed that across the board, management needs the same things to people, or that professional skills is kind of derailed down into a can you use Microsoft Office, which is great, and that is always valuable, but for us, we're trying to move past just this lens of beginner or just this lens of soft skill into the more tangible outputs of that skill. So if we truly understand what the research is saying about our workplace, that the architecture is shifting, we're working across teams, we're influencing without authority, uh, we're asked to manage projects, not people, then this means your people have got to learn how to communicate effectively because that's not something they learn in college. They come into the workplace and we expect that they know it. We need them to be maintaining balance in their life, balance in workplace, in home. We want them to be thinking strategically, not just uh, tactically, not just operationally. Where are we going beyond just these things that we need to fix? And always with that growth mindset. Many of you may be in organizations that have re-envisioned what you do over the last couple of years or who you recruit or how you retain employees. You want people to follow that journey with you. And so professional skills needs to be more than just tangible, tactical things. It needs to be mindsets. How do I adapt to change? Because most people stink at it. I mean, that's kind of one of the things that makes us human. <laughs> All right. Modern compliance. I talked a little bit about this, kind of our underpinning of how we think about compliance, which your provider should have a point of view on this. And with that, Yvette, I'm going to move to our Q&A slide. Awesome. Thank you so much, Summer, for your presentation and sharing your insights with us so candidly. We've got some great uh, questions that have come through, so I'm going to start with our first one. Summer, um, one of our audience members is asking, our CEO is asking you to deploy off-site management training for leadership skills mm -hmm. and focus the use of Cornerstone for general and compliance training. What are your thoughts of the effectiveness on online training versus ILT, instructor-led training for soft skills such as leadership? Hmm. Great question. So I, I think there's kind of two things going on here. One, every organization is always going to take their kind of high performers, leadership, do the off-site thing, the executive approach. It's always great. But I think the days are gone in which we say online training is only good for this, only good for compliance, only good for tactical. And this is why I say that. Leadership as a skill, as a concept, is always rooted in our ability to challenge, to engage, to present a new way of thinking. And yes, that can be wildly effective in person, but it can also be effective in a virtual training, assuming it's developed right. So if you're thinking about leadership solely for executives, I think there's a myth. As I mentioned, our, our focus is really leadership at all levels. Use the virtual content in leadership and management to propel change based on what your high-end leaders are learning and drive it as a conversation started throughout the year. I believe virtual learning can be just as impactful, just like I believe learning can happen in an instant. Over the last decade, you know, we've always quibbled about, well, if it's not an hour, then it's not real training, and if it happens in a couple minutes, how can I trust it? The proof is in the pudding. You can change someone's mind 
in an instant. You can have a meaningful conversation that shifts the focus of your life. I remember distinctly times when my career path was changed or determined based on something influential that happened to me. Virtual content can be just as compelling, but my caution to you and my, my uh, guidance is connect it to bigger things that are going on in your company. Don't treat it as a one-off. Don't treat it as a complete the online leadership training and then we'll say that we've given that to you. Connect it to bigger strategy for success. Summer, on a related note, we have one of our questions here around how do, how do we get leaders within the company to prioritize creating space and time for their employees to engage in training? Um, so often training gets pushed off if it's not required, like compliance training. Yeah. Oh, gosh, that's such a great question. These are the questions that I wish, you know, we could be doing it over a glass of wine because this is the stuff that gets me out of bed in the morning, right? This is where it's on you as a practitioner, as the person responsible for this, to market your function. So I think at the very base, this starts with making the case for learning beyond just numbers and figures. When you're talking to the C-suite, connect it to what they strategically prioritize. I believe we have done ourselves a disservice historically in predicating our value on the complexity of the programs we build or the fact that we are running a part of the organization that people don't really want to get into, like HRIS or learning management, and weighing ourselves down and, well, this is really tough to do and I'm the only one that can do it. Elevate the conversation to something bigger. Chances are your executive team is looking at where they're going over the next year, three years, five years. And if they believe they can do that with their current employee base that is not skilled to meet that need, they got another thing coming. Little thing called the skills gap, which is actually real. And you can find some great reports on Deloitte, on ATD, um, SHRM as well has some good stuff on this. Start making the case for your function beyond just training as a solution. Start aligning the learning programs you build and the infrastructure that you create with their strategic objectives. And that's one of the most profound ways to get us out of talking about learning as a deliverable and move us into the space of learning is just a requisite of this workplace. And if we don't do it wrong, we're gonna be in a world of hurt because our people are gonna leave. And this vision that you're holding so dear is never gonna be attainable. Awesome. Um, very, uh, looks like we have another um, audience member who has a very different question, almost the opposite. Their question is, when offering training for the first time in a company, how do you recommend rolling out the offering in a way where there isn't a concern that people will spend too much on training and not doing their work? Wow. God, I, I mean, I love this I, I question. Mean, <laughs> I love this question. Um, Okay, so first time rolling out learning, I get it. There's always kind of the sense of how is this gonna work? How, what kind of traction is it gonna build? How are people gonna respond to it? I would say in general, my experience and my concern has never been about people pursuing learning too much, though I understand from an executive perspective that might be a concern if this is a new shift for the organization. Here's where I recommend. I recommend first, um, I use a phrase often in the, in the terms of kind of virtual content, if you build it, they won't come. So offset any concerns from your executives of just building a learning program or making that available does not mean that people just flock to it. And we see this every day in our lives. Just because Netflix posted something new on Netflix doesn't mean that night I go and look at it. Just because there's a website available to me doesn't mean I go there. Learning is always punctuated by relevancy and context. So you will do well to think about connecting these learning programs with your organization, but also building in the infrastructure to say, we know at the end of week one, week three, month two, month three, whatever, how much people are engaging with this. We're actively pooling them to get their feedback on the program, and we are bringing them along with us. So it's not this thing that you release into the wild. It's something that you are deploying strategically to a very specific end. So when talking with the executives, 
It's, hey, this is just like anything else we roll out in the organization. When we shift the policy or we're changing a sales approach or we're opening a new campus, these are all things that are deployed thoughtfully and managed continuously. And that's the opportunity to track the progress and get early on feedback of, all right, well, this one team is really over-indexed on the learning. That's fantastic. Let's rein that in a little bit, but let's use them as ambassadors for the program for teams that aren't seeing the inherent value in what we're offering. Just a few suggestions. I realize these are quick one-offs, but Thank you, Summer. I think we're going to take two more questions. We've got one here about, you know, as a first timer in deploying learning, how do I get my employees who are already really busy to become excited about learning within the LMS platform versus using YouTube or another, you know, external source for them where they would have typically have gone to have gone that content? How do we shift that mindset? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it is a shifting mindset. However, I think there's an opportunity to present content as part of the LMS as complementary and additive. So I have found that companies have struggled with saying, stop sourcing it on your own, don't go out of bounds, don't look for this stuff. Use these people to catalyze the shift to learning. So you can say, however you're using your LMS or the content you're deploying there, these are the reasons why we're curating this stuff for you, and this is the content that we have placed high value on. In addition to that, those of you that have been used to just typing in a Google search and assuming that's going to bring you the most value, compare it. Give us some feedback. Rate them together. Give us the pros and cons and use them as both your champions and the biggest opportunity to improve your offering. Because I wager those that are so used just to going to Google, they have in their mind that because I typed in a word in Google, it's giving me the most relevant and the most meaningful at the top. And that just is not the way it is. Usually they're doing their own curation after it. So get them on your side to say, hey, that's a great tool for quick on the fly team-based learning, but help us evaluate this to make it even more meaningful and valuable as we go forward. Great, and the last question here is, how do I go about getting feedback from my employees on what type of training they want to take outside of the compliance mm -hmm. training I need, to, I need them to take? How do you recommend I get this feedback? Is it through surveys, company meetings? What's the best and most efficient way to get that insight? Yeah, I love that. Um, I think that the, one of the biggest pitfalls with surveys is we put so much emphasis on one survey that we send one time, and then you end up sending all those no-no notes of saying, we didn't hear from you, only 70% responded, blah, 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 which doesn't start the process in a positive way. I'm always a huge proponent for integrating it into the ways you already connect with your people. And here's where I, where I will say, I've learned a lot from my team, give them the, the passive way as well. Uh, some companies use things like pull surveys, something that go out more consistently, but then also have it as an item in your standing one-on-one. -on -one. Have it as an item in your all team meeting. Give them that consistent opportunity to respond in ways that are comfortable to them, always while making the case for your input is driving this change. And I think that context and that meaning with constant back and forth is always going to be valuable to employees. Summer, thank you so, so much. We're right about time, and I were, we would love to take any other questions you have. Please don't be shy. Email us at smbinsights at csod.com if we weren't able to answer your question. We'll make sure we, we can get you an answer, whether it comes from Summer or our team. And if you want to hear more about how we can help companies like yours with your learning strategy and your content strategy, please visit our website. Chat with us. We're friendly. We're happy to share our insights with you. Learning is at the core of what we do here at Cornerstone. And any way we can help you, we'd be happy to. Thank you again. And uh, please look out for my email from us with the webinar recording. And please give us your feedback. We really appreciate any kind of feedback we can get, whether you like the content of what we talked about, whether there are other topics that you'd love to hear from us, uh, please complete the survey at the end of this webinar. And a big, big thank you to Summer. It was a pleasure to have you, and we hope to do more webinars in the future. Thank you all for your time today.
拜。拜拜。